This is episode 38 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm talking with Mary Kit Kelso. Mary never grew out of the phase of being a horse crazy girl. Though she's now over 40, she's finally fulfilling her dream of writing equestrian books for others who haven't grown out of being horse crazy either. Mary lives in the Ozarks with her four very spoiled and very opinionated horses, as well as a large flock of poultry and enough cats to qualify her as the crazy cat lady. Her husband, though not an equestrian himself, understands and supports all of her equestrian dreams. She's convinced three of the best things in the world are the smell of a sun-warmed horse, the smell of leather tack, and making sure to hug her horses every single day. I could not agree more. So let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi everyone, welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Show. I'm Carly Cade and today I am so excited to have Mary Kit Kale Stowe on the show with me today. Hi Mary, welcome. Hi everybody. It's so great to have you here. I can't wait to learn more about you and uh, I always love to start these interviews off with, you know, the question, how did your love affair with horses begin? Well, I think I come by it naturally. My mom liked horses. She loved Westerns. Um, she rode as a, as a kid when she could, she rode Western. Mm-hmm. And of course, grandma worked with them in a farming capacity because she actually helped her father farm with them. So I think I just came by it naturally. We didn't have any horses, but we were always watch, watching Westerns. And, um, you know, my I have an uncle who actually used to ride rodeo. Oh, so cool. we, all, we all kind of were in, um, in, in that world. Oh, that's awesome. You can go and root on your uncle and and Mm -hmm. watch the rodeos. Rodeo is so fun. So you were one of the lucky few that were kind of born into a horsey family and and you followed suit, which which I always love. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. I I was galloping around your website and doing some research for the questions I was going to ask you. And I, I love this. Your bio says that you reside on acreage with your husband, four spoiled horses, a flock of charmed chickens, the office rabbit, an opinionated parrot, and the not so itty bitty kitty committee, which is so cute. Can you tell us a little bit about your herd at home, your furry friends? (laughs) Sure. Well, about 20 years ago, I was able to achieve my dream of owning a horse. Mm. I adopted the ugliest little foal and you don't ever say that about foals but she was big ears knock need she was the ugliest little foal mm-hmm. she was a hundred dollars because she was an oopsie foal the dam had gone in and out of sale barns nobody knew she was pregnant oh wow so I got fortune you know she she turned 20 last August so I got her when she was three months old and I had always wanted to have live in the country mm-hmm. And so when I got laid off in 2012, I no longer had to live within two hours of my employer for working from home. I turned to my husband. I said, well, I've kind of done the numbers. If, you know, if everything works out, this actually will save us money. And he forbid me to move further north. So we ended up on our our acreage here in the Ozarks. And the lady who was selling the property also had horses and she was selling her horses and I picked up a medicine hat paint stallion for $200. Oh, wow. Medicine was my, hat? What does that mean? Just that they have the brown on their ears and their head, but then their face is white. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. So you got a great stallion for $200 for in, two, in, in addition, addition to this horse property. That's so cool. Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and I knew because it's, I live in an old tin can on a hill. It's an old trailer. I mean, the, the, the place needs some love and we've been working on that. Mm-hmm. But I knew if I had a paint horse for my mom, she would live in a tent that had always been her dream. Oh, wow. So I, I bought Thunder for mom. And being how he was intact, I got my one heart baby from my mare and then I had him fixed. Um, and yeah. And so basically, I just, when they find out you, you like animals and you rescue animals down here, they kind of start 
coming to you. Mm -hmm. So um, I had my flock of chickens. We moved down with just a few cats. And then um, being the only property on the gravel road with no dogs, a couple of stray cats came and went, hi, I'm going to have my kittens here. So then that's how we ended up. We have 15 cats. Oh, my. Well, you probably don't have any problems with uh, mice. <laughs> no, we <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, we don't. No, we don't. Um, but yeah, so it, it's just, you know, it's, I, got a, I got a bunny from an auction. Um, four dollars. So I got the cutest little rabbit for four dollars, and he lives. Um, he lives in the house at the moment. But yeah, he's the office bunny, and yeah, we just it's 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 me, my husband, who actually is a city boy. So this is all very new to him. Oh, I'm sure, and <laughs> and good on him for embracing your love of animals. I also yes. did this to my husband. I've all of a sudden flew threw him into a flock of fur babies. <laughs> he's handled it in stride. <laughs> the parrot. Oh well, I've. Um, I, Branyan is about 25 now. And so I've had him forever and he's just a mouthy little guy. He, you know, what do you want? What do you, <laughs> is that what he says? He says, what do you want? Yeah. Except he says it far more rudely, but yes. Oh, I'm sure that's funny. And I heard that actually, uh, exotic birds like parrots can live to be like 80 years old or something. They live for like a really long time. Is that right? Yes, he is a Pionis. He's a smaller parrot. Mm -hmm. So, but I should, if everything goes well, I'll have him. Um, he's middle aged now, so I should have him by the time I reach Social Security age. Oh wow! So you said that your mom uh, preferred the Western discipline. W what do you ride with your horses? I don't ride. Um, I had a bad fall as a teenager and never mm. quite got back into the saddle, so to speak. But when I did ride, I rode English. And if I were to ride again, I ride English. Um, I wanted to do three-day eventing until mm. the bad fall. Mm -hmm. um, but probably now at my age, I probably would do dressage or maybe look into things like working equitation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a little jumping, but nothing too crazy. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You know, and that's a really interesting point you just made because it's not always about riding the horses when you have horses in your life. It's often about the relation or well, it's mostly about the relationship and the connection and the meditative kind of experience they, they offer, you know, just having them and taking care of them and having them in your life. So it's like, you don't have to ride to appreciate them. And then also what you're going to get into here in a little bit, I'm sure their presence inspires the work, the writing work that you do. So, it became, oh yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, you know, but I wanted to talk really quick about, you know, I understand that you always wanted to have horses at home and you wanted to have land, but you took the plot twist of being laid off and left Iowa to live your dream in the Ozarks. So, tell us about this journey. Why, why the Ozarks? I mean, you know, because it's like I don't know a whole lot about the Ozarks, but there's all these stories and there's that show on Netflix. It's like, you know, is it what is it like? Talk to us about, you know, why the Ozarks? Um, and then, you know, tell us a little bit about what it's like to live there. Sure. Well, I live on the Missouri-Arkansas state line, mm -hmm. or as I affectionately say, close enough to hear the banjos, far enough away to get a head start. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I can literally see Arkansas from my house. <laughs> okay. So really, it was a combination of things. My husband is not a winter person, so he forbid us to move any further north than central Iowa. Mm. Um, then the second part was I actually had a dream that we bought land on eBay and moved to the Ozarks. Wow. And I was like, well, you could buy everything on eBay. So I went down there and I found our original property of five acres, five acres of trees, no electricity, no running water, nothing. Mm. And... Um, we still have it. There's just a cabin on it. Um, but we would come down twice a year and camp mm -hmm. and we just fell in love. It is so beautiful down here. So we fell in love with the scenery and the landscape and just how beautiful it was down here. Uh, and then it is, it's cheaper cost of living. So then, you know, that was the other part of it to move down. Mm -hmm. And then you got your dream. You have the horses there in your backyard yeah. and you know, you have a bunch of furry friends and you're living the dream. And then and uh, you, you said before you worked remotely. Now, now you're working, you know, you, you, are, you have a corporate job where you go to, and then you're also an author. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. I'm actually coming to you from, from the break room um, where I work. I work for a small company that does some software work. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a help desk monkey. I'm a, you know, 
IT technician. And so that's what I do for them. And then on the side, um, I run my author home where I do editing author websites, book formatting, all that techie stuff that I just love to take off of other authors' plates. Oh, that's great. Talk to us a little bit more about the services you offer. Uh, and what is the name of your, your, I guess we can't really call it a, I don't like calling it a side hustle, but it's, it's like your dream job, right? That you're building yes. over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's called My Author Home. Mm-hmm. Um, and the website is just myauthorhome.com. Mm-hmm. And basically, I, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I love doing the tech stuff. I love dealing with websites. I love editing, formatting. Um, I ran a publishing company for several years. Mm-hmm. And one of the best parts about that was working with authors and watching their books come together and, you know, just get better with each editing pass and helping, mm-hmm. you know, kind of birth that book. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's what I want to do with my author home. So I, a little bit of everything. Um, I do promo graphics. I do book covers. I, you know, book formatting, editing. Somebody could actually come to me and we could take them from manuscript to, to publication. Oh, that's really great. And what a cool service that you offer for other authors, because, you know, a lot of times there, there is a lot of techie stuff involved in trying to, you know, particularly if you're uh, independently published, you know, going from manuscript all the way to finished product, you know, having someone like you in their, in the corner with experience and who knows how to do all this stuff is really important, but particularly the editing portion, you know, it's like a strong editing makes books even better. And you obviously have seen that firsthand. So I'll make sure to link to um, your your website for your business in the show notes. So that's a great segue to get into talking more about your life as an author. So, you know, what compelled you to become a writer of horse books? Talk to us about that. Well, I come from a very bookish family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my great grandma read, my grandma read, read reads, um, not so much now because of eye stuff, but you know, my mom read when my mom had diabetic complications from for her eyes. She got hooked up with the Library for the Blind and audiobook, so she listened to her books every night. Mm-hmm. So I just come from a very bookish family, and I made the 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 big decision at about the you know ripe old age of twelve that I was going to work on a horse farm and write books as an adult. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I, I wanted to create the same types of stories that took me away as a, as a, as a young adult and kind of gave me that escape, the books that I loved, mm-hmm. which is how I got into writing horse books. Mm-hmm. And what were some of your, your favorite, you know, childhood reads as a, as a horse girl? One of my favorite books is Dark Horse by Lynn Hall. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, it was set on a racehorse farm. There was a bit of a mystery involved in it. Um, there was another one. I can see the cover, the title, it was double standards. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was again, another one of those teenage angsty horse reads I, you know, grew up on the original saddle club series, the thoroughbred series, Mm -hmm. you know, all of those books back in the late eighties, early nineties that I love to read. And then I got into fantasy because I saw Mercedes Lackey's book, magic pond. Mm -hmm. And there was a horse on the cover and a really cute guy. And I was kind of right at that age. I was like, I want to read that book. So (laughs) that's how I got into fantasy and Mercedes Lackey's, her world of, you know, companions and Valdemar um, really drew me into fantasy then, um, which got me into, you know, Anne McCaffrey and the dragon riders. And so I, I write, you know, the contemporary women's literature set at the barn, but Mm -hmm. then I also like to incorporate you know, horses, unicorns, all the fantastical elements in my fantasy. Oh, that's so cool. So tell us about your, your books, about your, your different series, because you're writing a little bit across, across genre, but horses are still the main component to, or horses with horns, unicorns, I mean, it's the <laughs> same, like uh, are parts of your story. So tell us about your books, your books. How many books do you have? Um, throughout my entire career, I have probably close to a hundred. That's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> My first book was published, um, it was an erotic romance in 2002. And yeah, many of my, um, many of that pen names works also feature cowboys, of course. It's a, it's a good trope to use in the romance world. Mm -hmm. Um, But for Mary Kit Kalestow, I've got probably close to 15 books out. And I have the, what I call the Noble Dream series, which is set at the barn, Noble Dreams. 
And it is the barn experience that I wish I had. Mm. It is a bunch of 30, 40 something women dealing with life, but also being very competitive in the Hunter Jennifer arena. Oh, cool. And, and so this sounds like it's a, a series for, for more the adult side of things. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, it's, it is horse books written for those of us who still love horse books, but are tired of reading about teenagers. I love that. You know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and there's a lot, there's actually more of us out there writing for horse books for adults than, than people know, which is part of the reason why I wanted to put this, this together. But yeah, it's like, as an adult who loves to read books like that about horses, I'm so glad, you know, you're out there and, and my counterparts are out there. And I basically did the same thing you did. I wrote the book that I wanted to read because it wasn't out there. So this is really cool. I love this. Okay. So let's hear more about the books. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically it follows the set of four friends. Mm -hmm. um, the owner of the barn, Cora, her partner, Ari, and then um, her students, Sarah, Eva, and Linda. And each book focuses on one of the ladies and what's going on in their life. So it starts with Steady on Cores, which is the story of Eva, whose husband gave her the ultimatum, it's me or the horses. Oh, I bet you that does actually happen in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we know which one she chose because it starts with her at the barn. <laughs> uh -huh. I love it. And through the course of the book, they reconcile. And actually, through the course of the series, he actually starts taking lessons and starts showing. And of course, that creates new tension in their relationship because she's like, hey, wait a minute. The barn was my space. Oh, and and now you're. Yeah. yeah. It's like, wait a minute. You just, you know, barged in on my thing. Um, Linda was dealing with some infertility issues um, with an over controlling, you know, husband. Um, Sarah was you know, raising her teenage son by herself mm. and his father comes back into her life. Um, Cora and Ari are kind of navigating their partnership as well as what they want to do on the equestrian side of things. And so, yeah, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like a soap opera with horses. I love it. And it sounds actually very real to life. I mean, these are, these sound like things that people are actually often could possibly be dealing with. I, I just, I love this. This sounds like the perfect series for a horse lover. It's fantastic. And then uh, tell us the name of the series one more time. Just so, and of course I'll link to them in the show notes so everybody can get to the books. But just in case people are like, Ooh, what was that again? <laughs> it is the Noble Dreams series. Noble Dreams series. Everybody check that one out. So, and, and then you have a fantasy series as well, right? I do. I have a fantasy series. Um, it's the world of the Musimageum, but they're very, everything's kind of standalone and loosely linked. And it actually, it actually sprang from an idea that I've been working on for about 10 years, um, which is an, was an alternative history dealing with a world where basically if you envision Harry Potter, mm. but instead of wands, they use musical instruments to create their magic. Oh, well, that's fun. Yeah. And so, I am still, you know, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. It was a young adult book. It's not a genre I'm too familiar with. So I took the idea, moved it forward to modern day. And so now it's contemporary magic. So it's all happening modern day. Um, you know, the, and they use ham radio and the internet a lot to communicate. And so it's just a lot of, you know, trying to navigate this world of magic and strange things mm -hmm. without, with dealing with the whole corporate the the organization is very you know very old very set in its ways new things are happening the unicorns show up pegasus show up um dragons showed up actually in something that i just completed for a box set so it's like the world is changing and the old ways aren't working anymore and so they're all trying to you know navigate it and figure things out and each character usually has a somewhat sarcastic animal sidekick Oh, I love that. That's that's fantastic. I love the weaving of animal con connection into mm -hmm. storylines. That sounds exactly like what, what you're doing. I love that. And the name of that series again was? Uh, the series doesn't really have a name. They, they're all books of the Musa Magium, but they're okay. all under the same pen name. Got it. And, and you write those under Mary Kit uh, Kel Kelsto also? Yes, I do. Okay, cool. So we'll make sure to link to those in there. And I love, I love this conversation because you are writing across genres and it's like, and do you have, um, is it easy to switch back and forth or do you stay down one lane 
and, and finish what your thoughts are there and then go over to the fantasy? Or do you kind of write back and forth between the two? I write back and forth because it feeds me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can dive into the fantasy world and I finish that story up and then I can go over to the barn and the horses and it's like visiting with old friends again. And so, yeah, I bounce back and forth just because that's kind of how my mind works. Yeah. I, I like that. I like that too. That makes a lot of sense. Like I, I was telling someone before, like, I like to follow the muse. It's like, whatever is kind of inspiring me at the time, that's where I'll go because it's, I think that's where my creativity wants me to head. So it sounds like you're a lot like that, you know, like today I'm going to the barn in my writing or, you know, today I'm going to the fantasy in my writing because that's, that's where my head, my mind, my muse wants to go. Is that, is that? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. I love that. And I was curious, what do you think as an author of, of so many books, like what makes your books or any books like stand out from the crowd? Like why, why, why do you think people are compelled to, to read certain books? What makes them stand out? I think a lot of it are the books that speak to us. Hmm. So I started out as an erotic romance author. <laughs> you know, um, my, mom was like, yeah. <laughs> my, my mom was like, I don't know where that came from, but you write pretty well. <laughs> nice. You got, yeah. to, you got your mom in your corner. That's good. Yeah, I really did. Um, but for me, I got burnt out on that because as mm. much as I love romance and I am slowly working a little bit of romantic subplots in, although, you know, nothing, nothing beyond like PG-13. You know, sure. They look longingly at each other and that's about as far as it goes. But <laughs> I started feeling very constrained by the actual, just the stories. And I, I would, they all felt the same. They all read the same to me. And I know that's not the case. I know many wonderful romance authors, mm -hmm. but they weren't speaking to me and the experiences that I was having or wanting to have. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started writing the horse books. I finally decided that I would follow, you know, fo follow my muse. Mm -hmm. I was like, forget it. I'm going to write what I want, see what happens. Mm -hmm. What's the worst that could happen? Well, they won't sell. Well, eh, you know, we'll try again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah. So I think that's it. I think people are looking for stories that speak to them, them, um, publishing with the publishing company is wonderful, but I think in many ways, because we all like the stories that speak to us, it can become very homogenous mm -hmm. when you work with the publishing company. And of course, you know, having run a company, you want things that will make you money. Mm -hmm. You know, you may love a book, but if it doesn't sell, then that's not doing you or your authors any good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, th I think that's where self-publishing really comes into play. And the more you get readers and following, finding the books that speak to them, and the more that you get authors writing what speaks to them, um, then the better, I, I think it, it's, it's good for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it opens the door for, you know, because I think what you were speaking to uh, in your previous author genre, the erotic genre, is there, it's kind of form formulaic. There's a, a formula to most, you know, mass market paperback kind of uh, romance or erotica or, you know, any, any one of those. So it's like you were kind of stuck in the expectation of, of the format and then independent publishing kind of swings the door open to go off script a little, right. And write something maybe that isn't so mainstream and, and handles diff different kinds of topics. Is, is that, did I just, uh, Kind of take that apart correctly. <laughs> you you did, yeah. Because with romance, you have to hit the beats that the readers want. You mm. know, there has to be there has to be a happy ending. At some point, there's going to be the big kiss with the you know the music in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and it, it even happens like in TV. So, um, the last episode of Batwoman, my mm -hmm. husband and I were watching. Um, I don't want to say spoiler alert, but you know. Sophie and Batwoman finally kiss and I'm sitting over there going, you know, yes, yes, finally. Because I was like, I was waiting for that beat to happen. And part of the enjoyment was the anticipation of that to happen. But I was like, I knew this was going to happen. Right. Or, or we were watching the crossover crisis on infinite earth. And I was like, yep, I knew they were going to kill that person off. And my husband just looks at me and I was like, that's the author's mind. You know, you have to, to build up to that. And so you you have still have to hit those beats. I mean, you know, the horse people, I still want to make sure they're in the barn. I want to make sure they're riding. You know, they, they participate in, in jumpers and they do courses. So I want to make sure I get that experience in there. But I don't have to be quite so, you know, obvious about it. 
Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and this is a good space to talk about, you know, I, one of the questions I have here for you is what, which do you prefer independent publishing or traditional publishing? And it sounds like you have experience with both. And we've kind of opened that, that doorway because we talked about not having to be as on target with the formula or the beats, but, you know, still having those, but you know, what has been your experience in those realms and, and what, which do you prefer now? Definitely independent publishing. Mm. Um, I am, I've got a business mind. I'm a type A personality. I like the control. Mm -hmm. um, I like being able to do my own covers because for example, um, one of my erotic romances writing partner, which is still out there, but mm -hmm. the original cover, I don't know what they were doing with this model on the back of this horse, mm -hmm. but they were not the, the stra you could just tell for somebody who's lunged a horse, mm -hmm. the straps were not correct. I'm like, I don't know what you guys were doing. I'm just glad nobody got hurt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and something like that bugged me. I was like, how could you do this to my book? Mm -hmm. um, you know, forget the shirtless guys. Forget, you know, forget the nice, you know, high-end breech view. Let's, you know, let's, let's look at, you know, the straps on the horse and the fact that you guys obviously don't know how to lunge a horse. <laughs> so, for, yeah, so for me, I, I much prefer the control of independent publishing. I also, unfortunately, have been through some great publisher implosions, mm. and it's, no, never again. I'm, I'm not going to put myself in that situation ever again, because it's, it's just a horrible situation to be in. Talk to us a little bit about the implosion. Like, well, what happened? It, it sounds, obviously, like it was a pretty dramatic experience for you, but like, what did they dissolve the business, and then you, you don't know where your books went? Like, what happened in there? Basically... What what some unscrupulous small publishers do is they start not paying the authors that they think they can get away with. Oh. And so then they pit the authors who are getting paid against the authors who are not getting paid. So I, I've been in a couple situations. Um, in all cases, I'm very fortunate I got all my books back. If the publisher goes into bankruptcy, the author usually does not win. They usually don't get those books back. So in, in all cases, I was fortunate to get my books back. Um, they've all been self-published, but it's the it's the the not knowing that really bothered me, and the fact that because they they start to do it on the sly, that it's very much you know oh well you know obviously you did something bad so that's why they didn't pay you, and it's like this is a business transaction, guys, mm -hmm. you know, and so yeah, I've I've been involved in. Um, a couple publisher closures that kind of happened suddenly, but then I've also been involved in, Oh, look, we're just not going to pay you anymore. Wow. That's a, that's an uncomfortable place to be, particularly with your creative work that you poured your heart and soul into that sometimes takes years to complete. And then you don't know what's going on. So it sounds to me like they were withholding payments from you for no reason. <laughs> well, they didn't have money. That was the reason. Ah, I got they, it. They, they did not have the money to pay. Um, what what you should do, and I say this as somebody who ran a publisher for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. and the reason why I closed my publisher is because I was realizing in this new world, there was nothing I could do for my authors as a small publisher in the Midwest that my authors couldn't do for themselves. As independently published authors. As independently published authors. And I just didn't, that didn't feel right to me to mm -hmm. take half of their royalties mm -hmm. when I knew that, you know, I, I didn't do, you know, Book Expo America. I didn't, you know, there was no bookstore present. Mm -hmm. There was no big marketing presence that, you know, people couldn't do on their own. Mm -hmm. my, my contacts were their contacts. And so I, and I, and so I decided that, you know, to be honorable about it, you know, I kind of saw the writing on the wall mm -hmm. and, um, you know, released everybody that, you know, we're all still good friends. But when you, when you publish, you, you're supposed to take that money and put it in an account and not touch it. Mm -hmm. But obviously, when publishers are having cash flow issues, that sometimes isn't possible. And then that's what leads to situations right now um, that, that happen. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but what I love, too, is, is you, you had a lot of integrity. You closed the, the publishing arm. You talked to the authors that you were representing. And you said, you know, you can do this. And that, but then what you did with that is you started up your your other business where you are in the business of helping authors complete from manuscript to you know final distribution so so you're still in that loop but you're like helping them in a different way than you were as the publisher of their books which is wonderful 
you turn that knowledge into something differently that aids the independent author. Exactly. And what I do is, you know, basically I, I hold author's hand. Mm -hmm. Um, there are publishing services companies out there that say, well, if you know, you pay me X amount of dollars, I'll do all this for you. But there's no control there. There's no, you know, in in my case, authors choose me to edit their books. I'm not going to farm that out to anybody else. Right. Um, you know, so it's, it's a nice service that I offer without, again, being all transparent. I'm, you know, I'm transparent. I'm upfront. Mm -hmm. So it gives them the control over their creative product because yeah, I have helped so many authors over the course of my career. Um, you know, you know, my publisher just did this. What do I do? You know, here's yeah. a hug, here's some chocolate. Okay. Here's a plan. Um, <laughs> so yeah, keeping control, I think is so important because the industry is changing too fast to sign your rights over mm -hmm. to somebody who may not have your best interest at heart. That that's great advice. And then, you know, and then, you know, adding on to that, what, so say what, if, so what I love about your business too, is it sounds like it's very collaborative and you take what's important to the author and you have a conversation and you work together in that realm, which, which I love, but you're also there for sharing advice. But what would you say to, say there's a new author, just finished their manuscript, getting ready to look at, you know, do I query traditional publishers or do I do go the independent route? What, what would be your advice to someone just starting out and, and starting to dip their toe in, in the water? What would you say? Well, to paraphrase my parrot, what do you want? Because <laughs> that's the question. There are people who are like, I wrote this book. I just want to turn it over to somebody. I can deal with the edits, but let them worry about everything else. And then there's people like myself um, who are a little, little high strung, I'll admit it, you know, a little type A controlling who are like, no, I don't want to be stuck with the cover I hate. I want to make sure that I know what's going on, who are more take charge. Mm -hmm. Um, on one hand, I would say, don't worry about the money because there are people who would tell you that in order to self publish, you have to spend, you know, thousands of dollars on an edit for the record. I don't charge thousands of dollars, <laughs> you know, they, um, you know, the money is almost secondary to what makes you comfortable because one of the things that I have found both personally and professionally is that if I'm not comfortable with the situation, if, if my head isn't in the game, um, then my creative work is going to suffer. You know, there's, mm -hmm. if, if you're dealing with the publisher and the publisher is just, uh, you know, just, if they're just tough to deal with, you know, that's going to be the book that you're like, yeah, whatever, except the edits were done. You know, just get it off of my plate. Let me go focus on something that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can still do that while being professional. And so my, my advice would be to figure out what you want first. Are you the type of person who's willing to dive in to take in all the knowledge, understanding that there is no one true way to, for publishing at all? So all the people that are selling you systems and selling you classes are selling you what works for them and you're not them. So, you know, take what works for you. It's just like the editing advice. Take what works for you, discard the rest. Mm -hmm. Once you figure that out, then you can start to look for, okay, this is how I want to do this. And, and in the end, just don't let anybody make you feel bad about your choices. Well, that's great advice. And, you know, and, and I like, like a parallel to that is it sounds like you're asking people to educate themselves too. Like what, no one way is the way to do it. Educate yourself and kind of put the program together for yourself because there, there is a lot to know. And there's, there are people like you to reach out to that can assist people as they're moving through the process, you know, and it's, one step at a time, you know, because if you look at the whole thing, it's, it can seem overwhelming, but it's just one step at a time and then reach out to people like us who are here to help. You know what I mean? Is, would you agree with that? Oh, very much so. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I love that you have so much, you have so much knowledge, obviously, from all the, your experience and in, in, in having done so many books yourself, like, how how do you reach your readers? Like, is there anything special you do to to reach your readers and then um, bring new readers to your books? For me, the big thing is to be real. Mm. Um, and, and I and I do that for a couple of reasons. One of which is, um, so you mentioned, you know, that you know, there's other ways to work with horses, and 
I often describe my horses as my thousand pound Barbies. Mm. I go out there, I brush them, I make them pretty. Uh, but I do that for my own mental health. I have some health challenges. Mm. Um, I have a chronic pain condition and which is why I don't want to fall, frankly. So that's why I stay on the ground. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, and so I, I'm real because I'm trying to talk to readers who do not see themselves represented in fiction. Mm. Now, my horse books are the dream. I had a lovely barn when we lived in Iowa. They were just the best people. The trainer was wonderful. And I'm trying to bring that experience to readers. But like when it comes with my fantasy, many of my characters have um, disabilities. Mm. Many of my characters have, you know, one of my characters has rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Mm. And she's like, you know, how are you expecting me to do all this, you know, when, when this is what I'm dealing with? Um, I've had another character who has multiple sclerosis. So I, I try to, I, I'm real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm supportive and I love cheering people on, but I'm also not afraid of saying, you know, whoa, it's a bad pain day today. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I'm going through because I feel like when we put on a false front for anything, then that, then people don't see scene and they don't, they don't feel validated. And I feel like that's how I reach readers mm -hmm. is by making sure that my readers are seen. I hear from a lot of readers with fibromyalgia, which is what I have mm -hmm. and who are just so thankful that I'm speaking out about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's very painful. I mean, it, a lot of the things that you described there, it's, you know, it, it inhibits physical activity because you're not feeling well, you know, just in, in anything, you know, it's like mm -hmm. reading can be painful or like, you know, so, so I, I love that. I love that you're re being real is, is what connects you to your readers. That's awesome. And you're talking about real things, you know what I mean? It's like, you, you kind of create the, the dream there, you know, there's that dream reality aspect of books, but then there's also the opportunity to talk about things that are impacting people. And, and that's the beauty of, of writing. It's like, you can educate as at the same time as you're entertaining people. <laughs> Given the, the business that you also have, where you, where you assist authors, do you have any advice uh, to other authors on, I mean, I know there's a million ways to market a book, but would, do you have any advice on, you know, how they, how like a great way they could, you know, maybe take one tip from your toolbox to market their books. Sure. That's actually something that I'm still working and learning about myself. Mm -hmm. well, um, it's, it never, it's always, you're always <laughs> learning because everything's always changing. There's always new ways to get the words out there. And then the things that did work and were tried and true, they kind of fizzle out and you got to figure out what the next best thing is. So it's always evolving. <laughs> <laughs> it is. What I would say is find, find what makes your book different. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even if you're writing and, and apologies for, you know, picking on, picking on billionaire romances. Even if you're writing, you know, the, you know, the 80th millionth secretary falls in love with her billionaire boss book, there, there's still something that you uniquely bring to the story. There is a take on it, a character quirk that you can take that and use that as your hook for marketing mm -hmm. and to really make you stand out. Oh, I like that. That's good advice. Yeah. Look for what makes, makes you unique. Well, we're all unique, right? You know, there's only mm -hmm. one of us ever to walk on the planet. And, you know, so there is unique things to everything that we do. And that's good advice. Uh, I also like this. When I was, when I was taking a look at, at what you're up to, I saw that you use um, Patreon. Can you talk to us about how you use Patreon in your, in your author career? And in like, I noticed that you uh, offer extra special content to your, to your patrons. Like does, does how much time and extra work does that take to, to do that? Uh, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. Well, the good thing is writing is my self care. Mm. So, um, I also learned because the job I got laid off from was being in a call center help desk. Mm -hmm. I also learned to write in like the two minutes between phone calls. Oh, I cool. literally would be like, you know, thank you for calling. Have a nice day. Write my book. Hi, thank you for calling, you know, as the next call came in. So because of that, I write relatively fast and I write relatively clean from just being edited for so many years. Mm -hmm. So I do offer extra content. Um, I'm also not afraid to say that I bribe my patrons. <laughs> If you <laughs> if you join my highest tier, I will bake you cookies once a quarter. Oh wow, that's neat. Yeah. That's and different. I, <laughs> and I, I baking is you know I love to bake and I love to bake for an appreciative audience. It's just me and my husband, and he's appreciative. But you know I 
there's only so much we can eat. So I like cooking for other people. <laughs> Very cool. I just, so I just find things, I, I kind of have three different tracks with my Patreon. On Mondays, I do writing advice. And so like right now I'm talking about how writing groups can help marginalized authors. Mm. You know, those of us who are disabled, those of us who don't have good internet, those of us who have barriers, whatever they are, to participate in a writer's group. Um, on Saturdays, I do mental health advice. And mm. basically, this is what I have learned. This is what I'm dealing with. Maybe this can help you. And I offer free stories in a way to kind of boost my productivity because then when they're done, I will offer them for sale. But my patrons get to read them as they go and they get to read them, you know, as, as they're being written. So they'll get them first. Well, that's really neat. And then, you know, for for people listening in who may not know what Patreon, can, can you talk a little bit about what, what the platform is? And then how did you decide or discover it or decide that this was something that was, it sounds like it's working for you, you know, so can you talk a little bit about what it provides you? Sure. So it allows, um, basically allows readers to tip people on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an ongoing subscription model. You can join or not as you need to. Uh, you also set your own level. So mine literally started a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, throw, <laughs> toss a coin to your witcher, you know, throw me a dollar every month. I'll give you all of these goodies. Yeah. Uh, and so what it does is it allows you to build a community because one of the things that is so important is I think if we've all learned anything from, you know, social media and, you know, the ups and downs of technology is you can't rely on one platform. Mm -hmm. If you build a community to support you, then that community will help you through the lean months as well as, you know, help support you in the more exciting months. And so it allows you to build a community of readers who want to ongoingly support you and can do so at any level. Right. Which helps, which helps creatives continue being creative, right? You know, mm -hmm. because it, it is challenging to support yourself while being a creative and bringing more great content to readers. So it's a, so it helps readers get material quicker and then they get to see like the the process as it's being written which is really great and I'm sure you get excellent feedback from from your patreons regarding your chapters do they ever provide feedback for you and help you out in that regard uh not really I mean I, he I hear good things but a lot of it's just like more 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 <laughs> so that's the, that's the feedback I get but it's nice like with the mental health um, post to actually hear from people and say, you know, thank you for posting this. I really needed it today. That's uh, great. I mean, you're, cause you're, you're kind of rounding it out. Not only is it about the creative writing you're telling, but it's also about taking care of yourself. And then there's the advice also on, you know, that is an extension of the business that you run. So you kind of cover all the gamuts. I try. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. And then how did you come up with those concepts? Did you, did you just run with like what the muse is telling you and what was important to you? Or, or did you do some research about what works? Or did you just say, hey, Patreon, this is, this is my offering? <laughs> Pretty much the latter. Um, I have, I mean, I, I work, I work full time now. Um, but for, for my own health, um, as well as just for what I want to do, you know, that vision of that perfect life that you're supposed to focus on. Um, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to write. I want to help authors through my author home. And if I can share anything that I've learned, then that's that's what I want to do. So yeah, I was like, okay, this is what I want to talk about. Patron to me is a safe space mm -hmm. because people pay to join. Mm -hmm. And so I, I it feels better to talk about some topics like the marginalized authors group than just throwing it out on Twitter or throwing it out of my blog. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to probably bundle it up and create an ebook out of it and put that up for sale. But while I'm kind of working through the thoughts and working through the processes, I, it allows me to kind of create a safe space where I can do that. Well, that's really, that's cool. And I love it when you're creating content and specialized content, but then it's also has potential to be a bundle later mm -hmm. after. So, so you're, it's still useful. It's just like an outlet here. It provides value for your fans, but then also it becomes potentially a product, you know, in a few months or what have you. That's great. I want to ask you too, you, you also use another platform called Ko-Fi, which I have not heard of before, um, where readers can buy you a coffee. You know, I, I haven't heard about Ko-Fi. Can you tell us about what that is and how you use it? Ko-Fi is designed to be just basically a one-off platform. It's mm. a tipping platform. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and coffee is kind of a universal term. We all kind of know what buying a coffee is like, you know, mm-hmm. you know, $3, $4, $5, $7. Dollars. The, um, but yeah, it's, it's basically designed to be a tipping platform rather than just going to somebody's PayPal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, I used it this last winter, actually, uh, my mother passed away and I lost my income because I was getting paid to take care of her. So I used it this last winter to kind of crowdfund and make sure I could um, buy hay for my horses. That was what would you know make my life better is to have my stockpile of bales. And thankfully, we haven't had a rough winter here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got lots of hay. But, you know, I, you can use it that way. You can say, okay, here's my goal. This is what I'm trying to get. You know, I need a new laptop. I need this. And then people can chip in and feel like they're helping, you know, $3 at a time. That's lovely. And I'm so sorry about the loss of your mother. That is never an easy experience. And I'm so sorry. Um, and thank heaven for Kofi because look, it got you the hay through the winter, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, thank you for being so open and sharing all this uh, experience with us that I mean, you have so much. Uh, I'm curious, is there anything your readers might be surprised to learn about you that that they might not know? Like, can you do a, a reverse jump kick or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think people would be surprised to know that I'm as human as they are. Hmm. I, I do a lot. I keep myself busy. Um, I was my mom's caretaker 24-7. Um, I wrote about it in, our memo- in a memoir called Chronically Disposable. Hmm. Um, but that kind of assesses the issues with our rural healthcare system. But the um, I think it's that I... I've always been an overachiever and that type A personality. So I feel like I've got it all together. Nah, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what people would be surprised to know. I'm just as human as they are. Yeah, we're all dealing with something, right? You know, right. as much as we try to keep it together, there's still some, there's crazy going on all over the place. But, you know, I mean, good on you, though. I mean, that that type A personality has served you well. I mean, look at all the success that you have and, and you have your dream property and you were there with your mom through, you know, through these difficult times and through the end. And you obviously care a great deal about other people with the way you serve them on through Patreon and the things that you write. So good on you. And then I love to ask these questions too, because I, I there, it provides such interesting insight into, you know, what we're all dealing with. So, so for you, what has been the hardest part about being an author? But then on the flip side, you know, we all love our readers. The readers are usually always the best part, but what's been a really good part of being an author for you too? So the hardest part is learning that we don't see what we see is everybody else's highlight reels. Mm. We see the final finished product. Um, there are many authors who got published with Ellers Cave when I did who have gone on to become New York Times bestsellers. They've got, you know, agents, all sorts of stuff. And to think, well, why didn't that happen to me? That's probably the hardest part of being an author is learning not to compare myself to others. Mm. Um, but the best part is talking to the readers, finding readers who are passionate about things just like you are, or finding a shared passion over a TV show or a fandom. Uh, And I find social media is really good for that to to kind of connect with those people. But that's the best part. Absolutely. I would completely agree with that. And yes, the, that is a lesson that is not often easy to learn is do not compare yourself to others. Like, as you said earlier, we all have this unique journey and and nothing that we create is going to be the same as anybody else's. So to compare it, doesn't make sense. We all have our own path we're following and it looks different for everybody. So I think that that, that's a good thing to point out that can be very challenging as an author. And then, you know, since you are so involved and you have so much experience, is there one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? Like say, ah, that's not true. (laughs) Oh, there's so many. I would say that self-publishing is only for books that couldn't get published otherwise. Mm. Yeah, that is a, that is a myth for sure. Um, and do you want to expand on that at all and talk more about why you think that that myth is out there? <laughs> I, I think because, so I started in the days where we had to explain to people what eBooks were mm. and the days when, you know, print on demand meant vanity. You are going to, you know, iUniverse or somebody. So I have seen it all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think part of that is 
that back in back in the day <laughs> When I was a kid, going two miles uphill to school both ways, they, um, <laughs> with you know, no shoes and, but no and ten, shoes. Feet, ten feet of snow. <laughs> yeah, ba- back in the day, I mean, really, if if you you know you had very limited options to be published through a, a publisher, and if you couldn't, then it was just seen that your book was bad because there was not the transparency. Mm -hmm. Where today we have, you know, agents and editors on Twitter going, you know, I see so many books I love. This is why I had to pass. Um, And learning that, you know, the gatekeepers maybe were um, not keeping the gates that they wanted to, but the gates that they were told to keep that, you Mm -hmm. know, their, their publisher said, okay, you know, 50 shades of gray sold. This is why, you know, now I want you to acquire more like that. Um, and people not realizing that the, today's trends actually were acquired, you know, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think it's just as the industry has evolved, there's become more transparency, but there's still, you know, some of those myths that hang on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and as an independent author, when we all kind of band together, learn from each other, talk to each other and put out the very best products that we can from editing all the way to cover design. Uh, that is the best way to keep proving, improving, improving that independent publishing is, is incredible. I mean, there's so many, I mean, and actually it's funny you mentioned 50 shades of gray was originally an independently published book before Mm -hmm. it got picked up by a traditional publisher and then became a movie. So I, I love pointing that out too. Right. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And and that's why I kind of use that because it, you know, we are on the forefront of the trends. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been a lot of talk about diversity in literature mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, you know, well here, you know, here's all these authors, you know, who write all the different things and write their experiences. And we really were out there kind of, you know, building the trail for everybody to follow. Mm-hmm. That's great. And thank you for sharing that with us. And then, so I, I also like to ask this question, what's next for you? Like, what are you curious about now? I mean, you've got so much going on, but like, where do you see yourself going with your writing or with your, your business helping authors? Like what's up for you? What's next? I want to make an immersive experience for my fantasy world. And what I mean by that is, um, I talk about the radio arcanum times, just kind of the newspaper for the magical people. Mm-hmm. So I actually want to put that out. Oh, cool. You know, I, I'm geek enough that I reference these, you know, textbooks set in the magic world. And one of the things that I wanted to do ever since I had the idea was make a role-playing game, a D&D type game out of this world. And so it's like, I want to write these textbooks for my magical world. So, you know, if people want to want to learn more, they can. If not, it's just kind of a vanity project for me, but that's... You know, I, I want to write, you know, the ethics of magic and, you know, put that out for people or, you know, magical creatures in our universe sort of thing. Oh, and, that's and, neat. And start, and start doing that. I mean, it's all kind of on the back burner. The biggest project I have coming up is Muse Happens. And Muse Happens is an offshoot of all of my advocacy and coaching work where um, I want to talk to people like me, like, you know, probably like you, like anybody else who is trying to juggle life and writing and, you know, even, you know, health and health issues. Mm. And, you know, I don't want to say I'm a coach. I don't want to be like a life coach, but I want to be your mentor. I want, I want to, I want to help you. I want to provide a safe space for you to, to work through things and to, to try to, you know, really see that it's okay. It really is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. And then so Muse Happens will be like a, service that you provide like what's your vision like how how do people get involved with that or is it it's still not out yet it's it's not out yet it's it's I want to do classes services books um you know little one-on-one work I'm I'm still I'm still playing with it in my head I'm still trying to see you know what we want to do and I'm trying out like through my patreon through the mental health advocacy and that Mm -hmm. you know different pieces like okay I want to talk about this I want to talk about you know, other aspects of things and just kind of see what happens with it. That is really cool. I love that. So it's almost like an expansion of the services you kind of already offer, but offer that safe place for people in support of them in achieving their dreams. Does that sound right? That does sound right. Yes. Thank you. Very cool. And then with your IT background, it seems like you would be able to create that immersive experience that you're, you're talking about like that. 
I, I love that too, because that just takes the fantasy world one step further and really gives an experience to your readers. Like, and I imagine Patreon is going to be a great place for you to try, try that on with, with your readers. Exactly. Yeah. I am. I'm currently working on a story now that I'm going to release in a few different places, Mm -hmm. you know, for a dollar a month subscription sort of thing. And yeah, just experiment with it. Um, But definitely using my geeky background to, to see what I can do and how to make that work with some other tools that are out there. That's so exciting. Thank you for sharing all that with us and like what you're curious about. I think the future sounds really bright for you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and we'll have to do a little follow up and, and talk more about, you know, um, news happens when you have that available, because I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I love this space to be a, a resource for authors too to find other authors that are helping other authors and helping them achieve their dreams. So we can talk more about that when, you, when you've got your service launched. But for now, would you share with people where people can find you and your books and your business? Sure. So the author business is myauthorhome.com. And where they can find out more about me and my books is my website, Mary Kit Kalesto, C-A-E-L-S-T-O.com. If you know, I'm on Amazon, I've got an Amazon page. My Twitter is at Charmed Ozarks. I have Facebook, which is my page at Mary Kit Kilsto. I write on Medium as Mary Kit Kilsto. So I'm I'm pretty much everywhere. That's amazing. And I will be sure to link to all those places in the show notes so so they can get straight to you and your resources. And I'm sure everything links out from your website as well. That's wonderful. And you know, thank you so much for the gift of your time today. I just I love hearing what you're up to. I love it when authors unite and and you are completely supporting our community. And that is so wonderful. And I wish you tons of success, Mary Kit. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes, and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.